So the next thing that we want to look at is derivatives of inverse trig functions. Uh, but before we get to that, um, we should talk a little bit about a restriction of domain, right? So, so the issue here is that to, to define an inverse function, f must be, well, one to one. But there are a lot of functions that we want to define inverses for that are certainly not one to one. And the inverse trig functions uh, are, are one such example, right? Um, so if we think of if we think of examples like here's a simple one, right? Think of y equals x squared. There's probably the most common example of, uh, of a function which is not one to one, right? Uh, think of the sine function, right? So here's our sine function. Right. And so if you, think, if you think of this property of being one-to-one -one in terms of this horizontal line test, then certainly these fail, right? Uh, any horizontal line for, for a y value that's positive is going to cut this graph in two places. Any horizontal line for a y value that's negative doesn't cut it at all, right? Um, over here, in fact, any, any horizontal line with a y value between minus one and one is going to cut this graph in infinitely many places if we allow for the domain to be all real numbers. Right? Um, so certainly these are not one-to-one -one functions. Right? And if we were going to try to define an inverse, right, we have this, so both, and both of these of course have domain r. Right? So, um, so f of x is, is x squared, and the domain of f is r. Okay? Um, so we could think of this as a function from r to r. But the inverse, which, well, first of all, we can't define an inverse because it's not one to one. Um, but even, even if this were one to one, it only takes positive values, right, or at least non-negative values. So, so we can't define an inverse as a function of any real number. We can only define an inverse as a function of non-negative real numbers, right? So the first thing you need to do is you need to realize, OK, well, the range of f is 0 to infinity, right? So if we're going to define an inverse, first thing you realize is, well, it's got to be defined here. It can't be defined on all of r. But we still don't have a function, because our function is not 1 to 1. So what you can do is, is you can restrict. Right? And, and you, you generally try to take the largest domain that you can on which your function is 1 to 1. Uh, so one option you can do is you could take the domain to be 0 to infinity. Another option is you could take the domain to be minus infinity to 0. And once you do this, so we're, we're being a little bit lazy with the notation because once you do this, Technically, you're dealing with a new function. Okay? Uh, if you change the domain, you've changed the definition of the function, and you change the properties of the function. Right? For example, the function with this domain is now a one-to-one -one function, whereas the original one was not. OK, fine. Um, but with these choices, we can, we can now say, oh, yes, um, the, the inverse here is simply the square root function. right? Um, if we, if we want negative inputs, well, we just take the other root, right? We take the negative square root, right? So, so the choice of domain here, this restriction that we make, um, it also affects what the inverse is going to look like, right? But we can, we can make these changes, all right? And of course, we know that the square root function is only defined for non-negative entries, and that's reflected in the fact that when you take the inverse, you have to interchange the roles of domain and range. Right? So if, we, if the range was 0 to infinity 
for the original function, that's going to be the domain for the new function. And indeed, that is the domain for both of them, right? You come to something like sine, not one to one. So what you do is you say, well, look, um, there's a few things I know about sine. First thing I know is that I know the range is minus one to one. So if I'm going to define some sort of inverse, right, minus one to one, that's going to be the domain for this inverse function, whatever it is, right? So we want to define this inverse. Now, we'd like to get the entire range, right? So we want to get all possible. So we want for each y value between minus one and one, we'd like to choose an x value. Most people are comfortable with the first quadrant. So we're probably also going to take this first bit here, right? We're going to take this piece of the graph, OK? But that only gives us the values from 0 to 1. So what do we do? Well, we could take, say, this piece down here. We could take this piece here. But it seems more natural to have everything all one piece. So why don't we go and include that bit there as well, right? So minus pi by 2. So if we take that piece from there to there, OK? Then as long as we stay between minus pi, pi over 2 and pi over 2, right, and we throw the rest of the graph away, then what we're left with is a one-to-one -one function. So we restrict the domain minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, right? And now we can define. This, well, again, I, I, it's almost bad to call this an inverse. It's not the inverse of the original function, because the original function didn't have an inverse. But this restricted function does. So this is often referred to as the arc sine function. Okay? Um, you'll also see this notation, sine to the minus 1, kind of, you know, evoking the inverse notation, this minus 1 notation for the inverse. Um, stick to arc sine if you can. This notation can be a bit problematic because, one, it might make you think that this is a power, right? Because when we're doing powers like sine squared, sine cubed, that, that's where we put the power, right? But this is not the same thing as sine x to the minus 1. That's cosecant. We have a name for that already. This is something completely different. This is the inverse of the portion of the sine function defined between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. That's what arc sine is, right? Um, and by the way, because of the choices we make, notice that this, this particular function here, well, it has domain from minus 1 to 1, right? And it has a range from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And you do have to be a little bit careful about that, because if somebody says, you know, something like, you know, let's say they say solve an equation like uh, sine, sine of x equals 1 half, right? Well, you might be tempted to just say, oh, well, that means that uh, x is arc sine of 1 half. And you can go plug it into your calculator if you like, or you look it up, you'll find that arc sine of 1 half is, is pi over 6, OK? But that's not the whole story, right? Arc sine as a function has only one output, right? In order to be a function, it can only have one output for this input, right? But this equation has many solutions, right? So you could also have, you know, x equal to 5 pi over 6. Um, you know, or you could do plus 2 pi, plus another 2 pi, and so on, right? Uh, you can take either of these solutions. You can keep adding multiples of 2 pi. You will get additional solutions to this equation. But among all solutions to that equation, there is only one which is the output of arc sine, right? There's only one that lies in this range between minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, and it's pi over 6.
So that's something that you have to be a little bit careful about when you're working with inverse trig functions, something that trips a lot of people up. Um, but with practice, you get used to keeping track of what the appropriate domains and ranges are for all the inverse trig functions. Um, and, and hopefully, you'll keep yourself out of trouble. <laughs>